नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत सम्मास्बुस् नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत सम्मास्बुस् नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत सम्मास्बुस् Dhammapada Stories, Part Three, Book Seventeen, Story Two. The felling of a tree. For after the teacher had given permission to the congregation of monks to lodge without the walls of the monastery, and while the treasurer of Rajaga and others. were busy providing such lodgings a certain monk of alavi decided to build himself a lodging and seeing a tree which suited him began to cut it down thereupon a certain spirit who had been reborn in that tree and who had an infant child appeared before the monk carrying carrying her child on her hip and begged him not to cut down the tree saying master do not cut down my home it will be impossible for me to take my child and wander about without a home but the monk said i shall not be able to find another tree like this and paid no further attention to what she said the tree spirit thought to herself if he but look upon this child he will desist and place the child on a branch of the tree the monk however had already swung his axe was unable to check the force of his upraised axe and cut off the arm of the child furious with anger the tree spirit raised both her hands and exclaimed i will strike him dead in an instant however the thought came to her this monk is a righteous man if i kill him i shall go to hell moreover if other tree spirits see monks cutting down their own trees they will say to themselves such and such a tree spirit killed a monk under such circumstances and will follow my example and kill other monks besides this monk has a master i will therefore content to myself but reporting this matter to his master lowering her upraised hands she went weeping to the teacher and having saluted him stood on one side said the teacher what is the matter tree spirit the tree spirit replied reverend sir your disciple did this and that to me i was sorely tempted to kill him but i thought this and that refrained from killing him and came here so saying she told him the story in all its details when the teacher heard her story he said to her well done well done spirit you have done well in holding in like a swift speeding chariot your anger when it was thus aroused so saying he pronounced the following stanza whoever controls his anger like a swift speeding chariot when it is aroused him i call a chariot other folk are merely holders of reins 
at the conclusion of the lesson, the tree spirit was established in the fruit of conversion. The assembled company also profited by it. But even after the tree spirit had obtained the fruit of conversion, she stood weeping. The teacher asked her, What is the matter, tree spirit? Reverend sir, she replied, my home has been destroyed. What am I to do now? Said the teacher, Enough, tree spirit, be not disturbed. I will give you a place of abode. With these words, he pointed out near the perfumed chamber at Jaitavana a certain tree from which a tree spirit had departed on the preceding day and said in such and such a place is a tree which stands by itself enter therein accordingly the tree spirit entered into that tree then thenceforth because the tree spirit had received her place of abode as a gift from the buddha Although spirits of great power approached that tree, they were unable to shake it. The teacher took this occasion to lay down and enjoin upon the monks the observance of the precept regarding the injuring of plants and trees. Book 17, Story 4 Trifling Acts of Merit Once upon a time, the elder made a journey to heaven and saw a spirit possessed of great power standing at the door of his mansion. The spirit straightway approached the elder, saluted him, and took his stand before him. Thereupon, the elder said to him, Spirit, you possess great glory. What did you do to get it? O oh, reverend sir, do not ask me. We are told that the spirit had performed but a trifling work of merit and that he spoke thus because he was ashamed to mention it. The elder repeated his question, saying, Please tell me. Finally the spirit said, Reverend sir, I neither gave arms, nor rendered honor, nor listened to the Dhamma. All that I did was to tell the truth. The elder stopped at the doors of the other mansions also and put the same question to one after another of the female spirits who approached him. They likewise strove to conceal the works of merit which they had performed, but likewise failed to put off the elder one of them said, Reverend sir, as for almsgiving and the other duties of religion, I did nothing. But in the dispensation of the Buddha, Kasapa, I was the slave of a certain man who was excessively harsh and cruel. He thought nothing of seizing a stick or a staff and striking off a person's head. But when angry thoughts arose within me, I would rebuke myself, saying, He is your master, and his power to make public proclamation concerning you, or to cut off your nose or other members. Therefore, be not angry, Thus would I rebuke myself and restrain my angry thoughts. 
by so doing I attained this glory. Another said, Reverend Sir, while I was guarding a field of sugar cane, I gave a stalk of sugar cane to a certain monk. Another said, I gave a timbarusaka. Another said, I gave an elaluka. Another said, I gave a parusaka. Another said, I gave a handful of radishes. Another said, I gave a handful of nymph fruit. In such terms, did each mention the slight gift which each had made. All concluded as follows. By means of these did we obtain this glory. After listening to the recital of their former deeds of merit, the elder approached the teacher and asked him, Reverend Sir, is it possible to obtain heavenly glory merely by telling the truth or restraining one's angry thoughts or giving a timbarusaka and the like? Mogalana, why do you ask me? Did not the female spirits explain the whole matter to you? Yes, Reverend Sir, I am convinced that by such slight acts as these, heavenly glory may be gained. Then the teacher said to him, Mogalana, merely by telling the truth, merely by putting away anger, merely by giving a slight gift, men may attain the heavenly world. So saying, he pronounced the following stanza. A man should speak the truth. A man should not get angry. A man should give when asked to give a little. By these three acts, a man may attain the world of the gods. Book 17, Story 5, Nakula Mata and Nakula Pita. The story goes that once upon a time, as the exalted one, accompanied by the congregation of monks, was entering Saketa for alms, a certain old Brahman who lived in Saketa, passed out of the city and seeing the possessor of the ten powers entering within the gate, fell down before his feet and grasping him firmly by the ankles, said to him, Dear son, is it not the duty of sons to care for their mother and father when they have grown old? Why is it that for so long a time you have not shown yourself to us? This is the first time I have seen you. Come, look upon your mother. And taking the teacher with him, he escorted him into his house. When the teacher had entered the house, he sat down on the seat prepared for him, together with the congregation of monks. The Brahman's wife also approached the teacher and falling before his feet said, Dear son, where have you been all this time? Ought not mothers and fathers to be cared for? when they have grown old. 
and she directed her sons and daughters to salute the teacher, saying, Go, salute your brother. Delighted at heart, the Brahman and his wife offered food to the congregation of monks, presided over by the Buddha, saying, Reverend Sir, take all of your meals right here. The teachers replied, Buddhas, never take your meals regularly in the same place. Then said the Brahman and his wife, Well then, Reverend Sir, be good enough to send us all those who come to you and invite you to be their guest. From that time forward, the teacher sent to the Brahman and his wife all those who came to him with an invitation to be their guest, saying, Go, tell the Brahman. Such persons would then go and say to the Brahman, We would invite the teacher for tomorrow, and the Brahman on the following day would take from his own house jars of boiled rice and jars of curries and go to the place where the teacher sat. In case the teacher was invited nowhere else, he always took his meal in the house of the Brahman. But the Brahman and his wife gave alms regularly to the teacher listened to the Dhamma and in the course of time obtained the fruit of the third path. The monks began a discussion in the hall of truth. Brethren, the Brahman knows perfectly well that the Tathagata's father is Sudodhana and that his mother is Mahamaya. But although he knows this. Both he and his wife addressed the Tathagata as our son. And the teacher acquiesces in this form of address. Pray, what can be the explanation of this? The teacher overheard their talk and said, Monks, both the Brahman and his wife are addressing their own son when they say to me, Our son. Having said this, he related the following story of the past. Monks, in times past this Brahman was my father for five hundred successive existences. My uncle for five hundred existences and my grandfather for five hundred existences. Likewise, the Brahman's wife was my mother for five hundred existences. My aunt for five hundred existences and my grandmother for five hundred existences. Thus, I was brought up by this Brahman during 1500 states of existence and by the wife of this Brahman during 1500 states of existence. Having thus explained that he had been their son during 3000 states of existence, he pronounced the following stanza. If the mind rests satisfied and the heart reposes confidence in a man, one may repose confidence in that man, though it be the first time one has seen him. Through previous association or present advantage, that old love springs up again like the lotus in the water. 
for the entire period of three months during which the teacher kept residence, he resorted only to that family for his meals. And at the end of the three months, they experienced our hardship and passed into Nibbana. Men rendered high honors to their bodies, placed both their bodies on one hearse and carried them. The teacher, surrounded by a retinue of 500 monks, accompanied the bodies to the burning ground. Hearing the report, they were the mother and father of the Buddhas. A great multitude went forth from the city. The teacher entered a certain hall near the burning ground and remained therein. Men saluted the teacher, saying to him, Reverend sir, do not grieve because your mother and father are dead, and held sweet converse with him. Instead of repulsing them by saying, Speak not thus, the teacher surveyed the thoughts of the company, and preaching the Dhamma with reference to the particular occasion, recited the Jara Sutta verse as follows. Short indeed is this life. Even before a hundred years have passed, one dies. If one lives longer, then he dies of old age. The monks, not knowing that the Brahman and his wife had passed into Nibbana, asked the teacher, Reverend Sir, what will be their future state? The teacher replied, Monks, in the case of such as they, our hearts and sages, there is no future state such as they attain the eternal, the deathless, great Nibbana. So saying, he pronounced the following stanza. They who do no injury, the sages, they who ever control their bodies, such go to the sphere from which they pass no more. And having gone there, Sorrow not. Book 17, Story 7 Who is not blamed? Atula was a lay disciple who lived at Savati, and he had a retinue of 500 other lay disciples. One day he took those disciples with him to the monastery, to hear the Dhamma. Desiring to hear Elder Revata preach the Dhamma, he saluted Elder Revata and sat down respectfully on one side. Now this venerable Elder Revata was a solitary recluse. Delighting in solitude, even as a lion delights in solitude, wherefore he had nothing to say to Atula. This elder has nothing to say, thought Atula. Provoked, he arose from his seat, went to Elder Sariputta, and took his stand respectfully to one side. For what reason have you come to me? asked Elder Sariputta. Reverend sir, replied Atula. I took these lay disciples of mine to hear the Dhamma and approached Elder Revata. But he had nothing to say to me. Therefore, I was provoked by him and have come here. Preach the Dhamma to me. Well then, lay disciple, said the elder Sariputta, sit down. 
and forthwith Elder Sariputter expounded the Abhidhamma at great length. Taught the lay disciple, Abhidhamma is exceedingly abstruse, and the elder has expounded this alone to me at great length. Of what use is he to us? Provoked, he took his retinue with him and went to Elder Ananda. Said Elder Ananda, What is it, lay disciple? Atola replied, Reverend sir, we approached Elder Revata for the purpose of hearing the Dhamma and got not so much as a syllable from him. Provoked at this, we went to Elder Sariputta and he expounded to us at great length Abhidhamma alone with all its subtleties. Of what use is he to us? Thought we to ourselves and provoked at him also. We came here. Preach the Dhamma to us, Reverend Sir. Well then, replied Elder Ananda, sit down and listen. Thereupon Elder Ananda expounded the Dhamma to them very briefly and making it very easy for them to understand. But they were provoked at the Elder Ananda also. And going to the teacher, saluted him and sat down respectfully on one side. Said the teacher to them, Lay disciples, why have you come here? To hear the Dhamma, reverend sir. But you, but you have heard the Dhamma, reverend sir. First we went to Elder Revata. And he had nothing to say to us. Provoked by him, we approached Elder Sariputta and he expounded the Abhidhamma to us at great length. But we were unable to understand his discourse. And provoked by him, approached the Elder Ananda. Elder Ananda, however, expounded the Dhamma to us very briefly. Wherefore we were provoked by him also and came here. The teacher heard them say their say and then replied, Atula, from days of yore until now, it has been the invariable practice of men to blame him who said nothing, him who said much and him who said little. There is no one who deserves unqualified blame and no one who deserves unqualified praise. Even kings are blamed by some and praised by others. Even the great earth, even the sun and moon, even the supremely enlightened Buddha, sitting and speaking in the midst of the fourfold assembly, some blame and others praise. For blame and praise bestowed by utter simpletons is a matter of no account. But he whom a man of learning and intelligence blames or praises, he is blamed or praised indeed. So saying, he pronounced the following stanzas. This is an old, old saying, Atula. This is no mere saying of today. They blame him who sits silent. They blame him who says much. They also blame him who says little. There is no one in the world that is not blamed. There never was, there never will be, there lives not now 
a man who receives unqualified blame or unqualified praise. If men of intelligence always from day to day praise some men as free from flaws, wise, endowed with learning and goodness, who would venture to find fault with such a man any more than with a coin made of gold of the Jumbo River? Even the gods praise such a man. Even by Brahma is he praised. Book 18 Story 1 Cow Killer At Savati, we are told, lived a certain cow killer. He would kill cows Select the choicest portions of their flesh for his own table, cause the same to be cooked, and then sit down with son and wife and eat the same. The rest he would sell for a price. For fifty five years he kept up this practice of killing cows. During all this time, Although the teacher resided at a neighboring monastery, on no occasion did he give the teacher so much as a spoonful of rice gruel or boiled rice by way of alms. Unless he had meat to eat, he never ate rice. One day, while it was still light, after selling some beef, he gave his wife a piece of beef to cook for his supper and then went to the pool to bathe. While he was absent, a friend came to his house and said to his wife, Let me have a little of the beef which your husband has for sale. A guest has come to my house. We have no beef for sale. Your friend has sold all his beef and has gone to the pool to bathe. Do not refuse my request. If you have a piece of beef in the house, give it to me. There is not a piece of beef in the house except a piece which your friend has set aside for his own supper. Thought the friend of the cow killer, if there is not a piece of beef, in the house, except a piece which my friend has set aside for his own supper, and if he will not eat unless he can have meat to eat, he will certainly not give me this piece of beef. So he took the piece of beef himself and went off with it. After the cow killer had bathed, he returned home. When his wife set before him rice, which she had boiled for him, seasoned with leaves of her own cooking, he said to her, Where is the meat? Husband, there is none. Did I not give you meat to cook before I left the house? A friend of yours came to the house and said to me, a guest has come to my house. Let me have a little of the beef which you have for sale. I said to him, There is not a piece of beef in the house except a piece which your friend has set aside for his own supper, and he will not eat unless he can have meat to eat. But in spite of what I said to him, he took the piece of beef himself and went off with it. Unless I have meat to eat with it, I will not eat rice. Take it away. What is to be done, husband? Pray eat the rice that I will not. Having caused his wife to remove the rice, he took a knife in his hand and left the house. 
Now an ox was tethered in the rear of his house. The man went up to the ox, thrust his hand into the mouth of the ox, jerked out his tongue, cut it off at the root with his knife, and returned to the house with it. Having had it cooked on a bed of coals, he placed it on the boiled rice and sat down to eat his supper. He first ate a mouthful of rice and then placed a piece of meat in his mouth. That very moment, his own tongue was cleft in twain and fell out of his mouth into the dish of rice. That very moment he received retribution similar in kind to the sin which he had committed. With a stream of blood flowing from his mouth, he entered the court of his house and crawled on his hands and knees, bellowing just like an ox. At this time, the cow killer's son stood close by, Watching his father, his mother said to him, Son, behold this cow killer crawling about the court of the house on his hands and knees, bellowing like an ox. This punishment is likely to fall upon your own head. Pay no attention to me but seek safety in flight. The son, terrified by the fear of death, bade farewell to his mother and fled. Having made good his escape, he went to Takasila. As for the cow killer, after he had crawled about the court of the house for a time, Bellowing like an ox, he died and was reborn in the Avici hell. The ox also died. Having gone to Takasila, the cow killer's son became apprenticed to a goldsmith. One day, his master, as he set out for the village, said to him, you are to make such and such an ornament. So saying, his master departed. The apprentice made the ornament according to the directions he received. When his master returned and looked at the ornament, he thought to himself, no matter where this youth may go, he will be able to earn his living anyway. So when the apprentice came of age, the goldsmith gave him his daughter in marriage. He increased with sons and daughters. When his sons came of age, they acquired the various arts and subsequently going to Savati to live established households of their own and became faithful followers of the Buddha. Their father remained in Takasila, spent his days without performing a single work of merit and finally reached old age. His sons thought to themselves, Our father is now an old man and sent for him to come and live with them. Then they thought to themselves, let us give alms on behalf of our father. Accordingly, they invited the congregation of monks presided over by the Buddha to take a meal with them. On the following day, they provided seats in their house for the congregation of monks, presided over by the Buddha, served them with food, 
showing them every attention and at the conclusion of the meal said to the teacher reverend sir this food which we have presented to you is a food whereby our father gives render thanks therefore to our father the teacher thereupon addressed him and said Lay disciple, you are an old man. Your body has ripened and is like a withered leaf. You have no good works to serve as provisions for the journey to the world beyond. Make for yourself a refuge. Be wise. Be not a simpleton. Thus spoke the teacher. pronouncing the words of thanksgiving and having thus spoken pronounced the following stanzas now art thou as a withered leaf death's messengers await thee thou standest at the point of departure thou hast no provisions for the journey make for thyself an island hasten thee to struggle be wise when thy defilements have been blown away and thou hast forced thyself from the evil passions thou shalt go to the heavenly stage of the aryas at the conclusion of the lesson The lay disciple was established in the fruit of conversion. The assembled company also profited by the lesson. They invited the teacher also for the following day and gave alms to him. When the teacher had finished his meal and it was time for him to pronounce the words of thanksgiving they said to him Reverend sir this food which we have presented to you is the food whereby our father gives render thanks therefore to him alone so the teacher thanked him pronouncing the two following stanzas thy life is now brought to a close Thou art come into the presence of death. Thou hast no abiding place by the way. Thou hast no provisions for the journey. Make for thyself an island. Hasten thee to struggle. Be wise. When thy defilements have been blown away, and thou hast freed thyself from the evil passions, thou shalt no more come to birth and old age book 19 story 3 elder one verse the story goes that elder ekudana dwelt quite alone in a certain forest grove and that he knew but this one solemn utterance to the monk of lofty thoughts heedful training himself in the ways of silence to such a monk tranquil and ever mindful sorrows come not on first days elder ekudana himself alone sounded the call to attend the preaching of the dhamma and uttered this stanza whereupon the deities shouted applause with a noise that that of the earth splitting open now it so happened that on a certain precept day two monks versed in the tipitaka came to his place of abode attended by a retinue of 500 monks each when he saw them his heart was filled with joy 
And it said to them, You have done well to come here today. We will listen to the Dhamma. But brother, there are no persons here to listen to the Dhamma. Yes, there are. Reverend sirs, on a day when the Dhamma is expounded, this forest grove is filled with the noise of the shouts of applause of the deities. One of the elders recited the Dhamma and the other expounded the Dhamma, but not even a single deity gave applause. Said the elders, Brother, you said to us, on a day when the Dhamma is expounded, the deities in this forest grow, give applause with a loud noise. What does this mean? Brethren, on other days, there has been such a noise. I do not know what is the matter today. Well then, brother, you just preach the Dhamma. Elder Ekudana took the fan and sitting in his seat pronounced that one stanza. The deities shouted applause with a loud noise. Now the twice five hundred attending monks were highly offended at the deities and said, The deities in this forest grove show respect of persons in giving applause. Though monks versed in the Tipitaka uttered so much of the Dhamma, they gave not so much as a word of approval. But just because a certain old elder recited a single stanza, they shouted applause with a loud noise. And going to the monastery, they reported the incident to the teacher. Said the teacher, Monks, I call not him versed in the Dhamma, who knows or utters much of the Dhamma, but whosoever masters even a single stanza and clearly understands the truth, such a man is verily and indeed versed in the Dhamma. So saying, he pronounced the following stanza. He who speaks much is not the one well versed in the Dhamma. He who hears the Dhamma and practices what he has learned is the one who knows the Dhamma. Book 20, Story 6 The Pig Ghost One day, Elder Mogalana the Great was descending from Mount Vulture Peak with Elder Lakhana. Reaching a certain spot, he smiled. Thereupon, Elder Lakhana asked him, Brother, what is the cause of your smile? Elder Mogalana the Great replied, Brother, it is not the proper time for such a question. Wait until we are in the presence of the teacher and then ask me. So saying, Elder Mogalana the Great, accompanied by Elder Lakhana, made an alms pilgrimage in Rajagar. And returning from his alms pilgrimage, he went to Veluvana, saluted the teacher, and sat down. Then Elder Lakhana asked him about the matter. Elder Mogalana the Great replied, Brother, I saw a certain ghost. He was three quarters of a league in size. His body was like the body of a human being but his head was like the head of a pig, and out of his mouth grew a tail, and out of the tail oozed maggots. Thought I to myself, as I looked at him, Verily, I never saw such a looking creature before. It was because I saw that ghost that I smiled said the teacher, Monks, they that are my disciples have indeed eyes to see. I also saw this creature 
as I sat on the seat of enlightenment. But I thought to myself, should men not believe me, it would be to their woe. Therefore, out of compassion for others, I said nothing about it. But now that I have more galana for my witness, I speak the truth boldly. Monks, Mogalana has spoken the truth. When the monks heard those words of the teacher, they asked him, But reverend sir, what was his deed in a previous state of existence? The teacher replied, Well then, monks, listen. And with reference to the ghost's former deed, he related the following. Story of the Past The Destroyer of Friendships The story goes that in the dispensation of the Buddha Kasapa, there were two elders who lived together in peace and harmony in a certain village monastery. One of them was sixty years of age and the other was fifty-nine. The younger used to carry the bowl and robe of the older and accompanying him about. In fact, he used to perform all the major and minor duties like a novice. Like two brothers sprung from the womb of the same mother, they lived together in peace and harmony. One day a certain preacher of the Dhamma came to their place of residence. Now it was the day appointed for the hearing of the Dhamma. The two elders offered hospitality to the visitor and said to him, Good man, preach the Dhamma to us. So he preached the Dhamma to them. Their hearts were gladdened at the thought, We have gained a preacher. On the following day, taking him with them, they entered a neighboring village for arms. When they had finished their breakfast, they said to him, Brother, preach the Dhamma for a little while, beginning at the point where you stopped yesterday. Thus did they cause him to preach the Dhamma to the people. The people, after listening to his preaching of the Dhamma, invited him for the following day also. In this manner, they made an alms pilgrimage in all the villages round about, where they were accustomed to receive alms, taking him with them and spending two days in each. The preacher of the Dhamma thought to himself, These two elders are exceedingly soft. I may just as well drive both of them away and take up my residence in this monastery it myself. In the evening, he went to wait upon the elders. When it was time for the monks to rise and go, he returned, approached the senior elder, and said, Reverend sir, there is something I ought to say to you. Say it, brother, replied the senior elder. The preacher of the Dhamma thought a little, and then said, Reverend sir, what I have to say carries with it severe censure. And without telling a thing, he departed, going immediately to the junior elder and acting in precisely the same manner. On the second day, he did the same thing again. On the third day, the two elders were agitated beyond measure. The preacher of the Dhamma approached the senior elder and said to him, 
Reverend Sir, there is something I ought to say, but I dare not say it in your presence. But the elder pressed him for a reply, saying, Never mind, brother, say what you have to say. Finally, the preacher of the Dhamma said, But Reverend Sir, has the junior elder anything to do with you? Good man, what say you? We are like sons, sprung from the womb of the same mother. Whatever one of us receives, the other receives also. All this time, I have never seen a single thing in him that is wrong. Is that so, Reverend Sir? That is so, Brother. Reverend Sir, this is what the junior elder said to me. Good man, you are of gentle birth. But as for this senior elder, if you intend to have anything to do with him, and if you believe him to be modest and amiable, you had better look out. And this he has said repeatedly to me ever since the day I came here. When the senior elder heard these words, his heart was filled with anger. Indeed, he has shattered, even a supporter's vessel is shattered when struck with the stick. Then the preacher of the Dhamma arose from where he sat, went to the junior elder, and said the same thing to him. The junior elder was shattered, just as the senior elder had been before him. Now, although during all the years they had lived together, neither of them had entered the village singly to receive arms. On the following day, the junior elder entered the village alone to receive arms. Preceding his brother and stopping at the hall of state, while the senior elder followed after. When the junior elder saw his brother, he thought to himself, Ought I to take his bowl and rope or not? I will not take them now, he decided. But no sooner had he done so, then the thought came to him, Hold! I have never done such a thing before. I ought not to omit my duty. So softening his heart, he approached the elder and said to him, Reverend sir, give me your bow and robe. Said the senior elder, Be gone, you miscreant. You are not fit to take my bow and robe. So saying, he snapped his fingers in contempt. Then said the junior elder, Yes, reverend sir, I also thought to myself, I will not take your bowl and robe, said the senior elder. Brother novice, do you think that I have any attachment for this monastery? said the junior elder. But, Reverend Sir, do you suppose that I have any attachment for this monastery? This is your monastery. Sir, saying, he took bowl and robe and departed. Likewise, the senior elder departed. Instead of going out together, one of the elders went out by the western door and went this way, while the other went out by the eastern door and went his way. The preacher of the Dhamma said to them, Do not go. The elder replied, You remain, brother. 
so the preacher of the Dhamma remained. When the preacher of the Dhamma entered the neighboring village on the following day, people asked him, Reverend Sir, where are the reverend monks? Brethren, do not ask me, replied the preacher of the Dhamma. The monks who used to resort to your houses had a quarrel yesterday and left the monastery. I tried to prevent them from going, but was unable to do so. Now, some of the people were simpletons, and they remained silent. But others who were wise said, During all this time we have never seen anything you might call a quarrel between the two reverend monks. If they have been frightened away, they must have been frightened away by this newcomer, and they were deeply affected with grief. As for the elders, no matter where they went, they were unable to secure peace of mind. The senior elder thought to himself, Oh, what a grievous wrong it was that the novice did. The moment he saw this visiting monk, he said to him, have nothing to do with the senior elder. Likewise, the junior elder thought to himself, Oh, what a grievous wrong it was that the senior elder did. The moment he saw this visiting monk, he said to him, Have nothing to do with this junior monk. They were unable either to rehearse a sacred word or to fix their attention. After a hundred years had passed, both of them came to the same monastery in the western country, and both received the same quarters. No sooner had the senior elder entered and taken his seat on the bed than the junior elder came in. As soon as the senior elder saw him, he recognized him and could not restrain his tears. The junior recognized the senior and with tear-filled eyes thought, Shall I speak or shall I not speak? Then thinking that was not worthy of belief, he saluted the elder and said, Reverend Sir, in all the time during which I took your bowl and robe and accompanied you about, did you ever know me to do anything improper in thought, word, or deed? No, brother, I never did. Then why did you say to the preacher of the law, have nothing to do with this man. Brother, I never said such a thing. I was told, however, that you said that very thing about me. Reverend Sir, neither did I ever say such a thing. At that moment, they both realized he must have said this to cause a breach between us, and each confessed his transgression against the other. So it happened that on that day two elders, who for the space of a hundred years had not been able to secure peace of mind, became reconciled once more. And they said, let us go and drive him out of that monastery. So they set out, and in due course arrived at the monastery. When the preacher of the Dhamma saw the two elders, 
he approached to take their bowls and robes. But the elders snapped their fingers in his face and said to them, You are not fit to reside in this monastery. Unable to endure the rebuke, the preacher of the Dhamma instantly departed from the monastery and ran away. So, one who had practiced meditation for 20,000 years was unable to endure a rebuke. Passing from that state of existence, he was reborn in the Avicii hell. After enduring torment there for the space of an interval between two Buddhas, he now endures suffering on Mount Valchupi with the body as described above. When the teacher had related his former deed, he said, Monks, a monk ought to be tranquil in thought, word and deed. So saying, he pronounced the following stanza. One should be guarded in word and restrained in thought. Likewise, with the body, one should do no wrong. Should one make clear these three paths of action, one will gain the path made known by the sages. Book 20, Story 7 Tacho Potila Potila, it seems, bore the title versed in the Dhamma through the dispensations of all seven Buddhas and recited the Dhamma to a company of Five hundred months. One day the teacher thought to himself, It is not even occurred to this monk to win for himself escape from suffering. I will stir him up. From that time forward, whenever that monk came to wait upon him, he would say to him, Come. Tachapotila, salute, Tachapotila, sit, Tachapotila, go, Tachapotila. And when Potila had risen from his seat and gone, he would say, Tachapotila has gone. Potila thought to himself, I am versed in the entire canon. Moreover, I recite the Dhamma to five hundred monks, eighteen great companies. Yet the teacher addresses me always as Potila, the empty hay. Tacha Potila. It is doubtless because I have not developed the jhanas that the teacher thus addresses me. Much stirred up, he said to himself, I will straight away enter the forest and engage in meditation. Accordingly, that very evening, he put bowl and rope in order, and when it was dawn, set out, accompanying the monk, who was the last of all to master the dumb. The monk's who sat in their cells repeating the Dhamma, did not notice that it was their teacher. Potila went a distance of a hundred and twenty leagues, finally arriving at a forest hermitage with thirty monks resided. Approaching the monks, he saluted the elder of the community and said to him, Reverend sir, be my refuge. Brother, 
You are a preacher of the Dhamma. It is we who have something to learn from you. Why do you speak thus? Reverend sir, do not act thus. Be my refuge. As a matter of fact, all of those monks were arahats. The senior elder thought to himself, This monk, by reason of great learning, is affected with pride, and therefore sent him to a junior elder. Pautila said the same thing to the junior elder. In like manner, each of the monks sent him to his junior. Finally, they sent him to the youngest of all, a seven-year-old novice, who was sitting in his day quarters doing needlework. Thus did they humble his pride. His pride humbled. Bhotila raised his clasped hands in an attitude of reverent supplication to the novice and said to him, Good sir, be my refuge. O oh, teacher, replied the novice, what say you? You are of mature age and of great learning. It is I who have something to learn from you. Do not act thus, good sir. Only be my refuge. Reverend sir, if you will patiently endure admonition, I will be your refuge. I will do so, good sir. If you say to me, enter the fire, I will enter the fire. Thereupon the novice pointed out a pool of water not far off and said to him, Reverend sir, plunge into this pool, robes and all. For although the novice knew full well that Potila had on under and upper garments of great values, robes of double fold, he spoke thus to a certain whether he was tractable or not. No sooner were the words spoken then the elder plunged into the water. When the novice saw that the skirts of Potila's robe were dripping, he said, Come hither, reverend sir. No sooner did the novice speak than Potila came and stood before him. Said the novice to Potila, Reverend sir, if there are six holes in a given ant hill, and a lizard enters the ant hill by one of these holes, he that would catch the lizard stops up five of the six holes, leaving the sixth hole open, and catches the lizard in the hole by which he entered. Precisely so should you deal with the six doors of the senses. Close five of the six doors and devote your attention to the door of the mind. To the monk, learned as he was, the words of the novice were as the lighting of a lamp. Let that suffice, good sir, said he, and concentrating his attention on the material body, he began to meditate. The teacher, even as he sat at a distance of a hundred and twenty leagues, surveyed that monk and thinking to himself, this monk must so establish himself as to become a man of great wisdom, sent forth a luminous image of himself, which went and spoke with the monk as it were, pronouncing the following stanza. From meditation springs wisdom. From lack of meditation, wisdom dwindles away. He that knows this twofold path of gain and loss 
should so conduct himself that wisdom may increase. At the conclusion of the stanza, Potila was established in our hardship. Book 23, Story 3 The Old Brahman and His Sons The story goes that there lived in Savati a certain Brahman who had four sons and whose wealth amounted to 800,000 pieces of money. When his sons reached marriageable age, he arranged marriages for them and gave them 400,000 pieces of money. After the sons of merit, the Brahmin's wife died, whereupon the sons took counsel together and saying, If this Brahmin marries again, the family fortune will be divided among her children and there will be nothing left of it. Come then, let us succor our father and win his favor. Accordingly, they waited upon him faithfully, providing him with the choicest food and the finest clothes, rubbing his hands and feet, and performing all of the other duties. One day, they went to wait upon him and found that he had fallen asleep. Although it was broad daylight, as soon as he awoke, he rubbed his hands and his feet, and while thus engaged, spoke to him of the disadvantage of living in separate houses. Said they, We will wait upon you after this manner. So long as you live, give us the rest of your wealth also. In compliance with their request, the Brahman gave each of them a hundred thousand more. Not, but under and upper garments did he keep for himself. All the rest of his wealth and possessions he divided into four portions and handed over to his sons. For a few days, his oldest son ministered to his needs. One day, however, as he was returning to the house of his oldest son, after his bath, his daughter-in-law, who stood at the gate, saw him and said to him, Did you give your oldest son a hundred or a thousand pieces of money more than you gave your other sons? You certainly gave each of your sons Two hundred thousand pieces of money. Do you not know the way to the house of any of your other sons? The Brahman answered angrily, Perish, vile woman, and went to the house of his second son. But in a few days he was driven out from the house of his second son, as he had been from the house of the first, and in like manner from the houses of his two youngest sons. Finally, he found himself without a single house he could enter. enter. Thereupon, he retired from the world and became a monk of the Pandaranga order, begging his food from door to door. In the course of time, he became worn out by old age, and his body withered away as the result of the poor food he ate, 
and the wretched quarters in which he was obliged to sleep. One day, after he had returned from his begging rounds, he lay down on his back and fell asleep. When he awoke from sleep and sat up and surveyed himself and reflected that there was no one of his sons to whom he might go for refuge, he thought to himself, they say that among Gautama has a countenance that does not frown, a face that is frank and open, that his manner of conversing is pleasant, and that he greets strangers in a kind and friendly way. Possibly, if I go to the monk Gautama, I shall receive a friendly greeting. So adjusting his under and upper garments, taking his arms bow and grasping his staff, he went to the exalted one, even as it is said. Now a certain Brahman, a man who had formerly possessed wealth and social position, rough, clad in rough garments, drew near to where the exalted one was, and having drawn near, sat down respectfully on one side, and as he sat respectfully on one side, the exalted one greeted him in a pleasant manner, and said this to him, How comes it, Brahman, that you are rough, and clad in rough garments. Sir Gautama, I have four sons living in the world, but instigated by their wives, they've driven me out of their house. Well then, Brahman, learn these stanzas thoroughly, and when the people are gathered together in the hall, and your sons are gathered together with them, Recite them before the assembled company. They at whose birth I rejoiced, whose birth I desired, even they, instigated by their wives, keep me away as a dog would a hog. Wicked and worthless, they say to me, Dear Father, dear Father, all grows in the form of sons. They forsake me in my old age. When a horse is grown old and useless, he is deprived of food. So likewise a father of simpletons, as a monk, bakes his food from door to door, better the staff for me than disobedient son. The staff keeps off the savage bull, and likewise the savage dog. In darkness it is before, in the deep or shallow he prospers. By the power of the staff he recovers his footing when he stumbles. The Brahman, taught by the teacher, learned these stanzas by heart. On the day appointed for the Brahmans to assemble, the sons of the Brahman pushed their way into the hall, dressed in their costliest garments, adorned with all their jewels, and sat down on a costly seat in the midst of the Brahmans. Thereupon the Brahman said to himself, Now is my opportunity. So he entered the hall, made his way into the midst of the assemblage, lifted up his hand and said, I desire to recite certain stanzas to you. Pray, listen to me. 
Recite them, Brahman. We are listening. So the Brahman stood there and recited the stanzas which he had learned from the teacher. Now at that time, this was the law of mankind. If any devour the substance of mother and father, and support not mother and father, he shall be put to death. Therefore the sons of that Brahman fell at their father's feet and begged him to spare their lives, saying, Dear father, spare our lives. Out of the softness of a father's heart, the Brahman said, Sirs, do not kill my sons. They will support me. The man said to his sons, Sirs, if from this day you do not take proper care of your father, we will kill you. The sons, thoroughly frightened, seated their father in a chair, raised the chair with their own hands and carried their father home. They anointed the body of their father with oil, flying this way and that in their haste, bathed him, employing perfumes and aromatic powders, and having so done, summoned their wives and said to them, From this day forth, you are to take proper care of our father. If you neglect this duty, we shall punish you. And they set the choicest viands before him. As a result of the wholesome food which the Brahman had to eat and the comfortable quarters in which he slept, strength came back to him after a few days and his senses were refreshed. As he surveyed his person, he thought to himself, I have gained this success through the monk Gautama. So, desiring to make him a present, he took a pair of cloth and went to the exalted one. And after exchanging friendly Greetings, took his seat respectfully on one side. Then he laid the pair of clothes at the feet of the exalted one and said to him, Sir Gautama, we Brahmins desire that a teacher shall receive the tribute which is his due. May my Lord Gautama, my teacher, accept the tribute which is due to him as a teacher. Out of compassion for the Brahman, the teacher accepted the present which he had brought and preached the Dhamma to him. At the conclusion of the summon, the Brahman was established in the refuges. Thereupon the Brahman said to the teacher, Sir Gautama, my sons provide me regularly with four meals. Two of these I give to you. The teacher replied, That is well, Brahman, but we shall go only to such houses as we please. So saying, he dismissed him. The Brahman went home and said to his sons, The monk Gautama is my friend, and I have given him two of the meals with which you regularly provide me. When he arrives, be not heedless of your duty. Very well, replied his sons, promising to do as he said. 
On the following day, the teacher set out on his arms pilgrimage and stopped at the door of the house of the Brahman's oldest son. When the Brahman's oldest son saw the teacher, he took his bowl, invited him into the house, seated him on a costly couch, and gave him the choicest of food. On the succeeding days, the teacher went to the houses of the other sons in order, and all of them provided hospitable entertainment for him in their houses. One day, when a holiday was at hand, the eldest son said to his father, Dear father, in whose honor shall we make merry? The Brahman replied, The monk Gautama is my friend, and I know no others. Well then, invite him for the morrow with his five hundred monks. The Brahman did so. So on the following day, the teacher came to the house with his attendant monks. The house was smeared with fresh cow dung and decked in festive array. The Brahman provided seats within the house for the congregation of monks presided over by the Buddha and served them with rice porridge sweetened with honey and with the choicest of food, both hard and soft. In the course of the meal, the Brahmins' four sons seated themselves before the teacher and said to him, Sir Gautama, we care tenderly for our father. We never neglect him. Just look at him. The teacher replied, You have done well. Wise men of old likewise care tenderly for their mother and father. So saying, he related in detail the Matu Posaka Nagaraja Jataka, in which the story is told of how the Salaki tree and the Kutaja plant grew up and blossomed in the absence of the elephant. Having so done, he pronounced the following stanza. The elephant, Dhanapala, with pungent juice flowing from his temples, hard to restrain, eats not a morsel so long as he is held captive. The elephant remembers the elephant grove. As the teacher related this Jataka, Detailing his own deed in a previous state of existence, his hearers shed floods of tears, and by reason of the softness of their hearts, allowed their ears to droop. Thus did the exalted one, knowing full well what would be of advantage to them, Proclaim the truths and preach the Dhamma. At the conclusion of the lesson, the Brahman, together with his sons and daughters-in-law, was established in the fruit of conversion.